Hey everyone, I'm Jay Watson with Emory Brain Health and I'm joined once again by renowned pandemic expert, Dr. Carlos Del Rio, Executive Associate Dean of Emory University School of Medicine at Grady Health System and Professor of Medicine, Global Health and Epidemiology. Welcome once again, Dr. Del Rio. Oh, happy to be with you. Um, I can tell you that uh, this week, the questions have really poured in in advance of the two of us talking today. Um, so as always, we have a lot to get to from people who uh, need your expertise right now, and we will begin with this. I was shocked that the number of Americans who could die from this is now over 100,000. Is that really true? And does this mean it's too late to do anything to make that number lower? So a couple of things. Uh, with everything that is being done so far, the projected numbers are between 100 and 200,000 dead from this disease in the United States. Had we not done the things we've done, the projected number was anywhere between 1.8 and 2.2 million people. So we need to emphasize that this is tenfold lower than what could have been and nothing had been done. Having said that, I think if we continue to doing what we're doing and even do more of it, you know, the president extended the, the stay at home through April 30th. I think if we really do a lot of what we need to do and we all do our part, that number can actually be lower. My hope is that it's gonna be under 100,000. But let's start by saying that it could have been 1.8 to 2.2 million. So the reality is what we've done has already decreased it by a factor of 10. Okay. My husband and I both know we have it. We've been to the hospital and they think we do, but we aren't sick enough to admit, even though we are both having breathing issues and we can't get tested. Is this ever going to change? Also, the state says over 4,000 people in Georgia have it. What do you think the real number is? Because that sure doesn't include us. Well, there's several things. I think that we're still having issues scaling up testing. And I think both the state and the country are, are, are doing better and are going to do better over the next several weeks of getting even more testing out there. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and the numbers will go up simply because there's more testing. But I think it's really important to, to say that that beyond the numbers, there's plenty of people who have, have that had the disease and haven't been diagnosed or have already gotten over it. I would say that take care of yourself, stay at home. If you're having issues breathing, you may need to be in the hospital. If the hospital said you don't need to be admitted, stay at home, take care of yourself. And I'd rather not venture into the street simply to get tested if you don't need it, because again, you may be transmitting to other people. So it's better to stay home and just recover there. Is it, is it safe to guess, though, that the numbers in Georgia could be how many fold over the 4,000 that we know of? I mean, you know, it's, it's, it's 10 it's times very, more. It's, it's very hard to, to, to figure that. But a rough estimates, it's eight to 10 times the number actually uh, of reported. And the number reported is based on number of diagnosed individuals. So a conservative estimate will be somewhere between, you know, eight and 10 times the number that actually exists. OK, thank you. I'm reading a lot of reports that the CDC is going to change recommendations to all of us wearing masks whenever we leave our houses. Is this because of all the stories I've been seeing that the virus can actually live in the air for up to three hours? Because before now, we've been told to leave masks for healthcare workers. I feel like I don't know who to believe anymore, and I can't trust the agencies who are supposed to protect us. So several things, and I've said this, and I'm going to say it again, throughout okay. an outbreak like this, which is totally unknown, something we've never confronted before. As information is becoming available, as we're learning things, what we said yesterday may not be valid today. And it's not that we were lying to you yesterday, it's simply because the information we had had us do something one way, but then as we get more information, we're learning more things and we're making changes. That doesn't mean that what we say today is gonna to be applicable tomorrow. I think, again, information is changing, we're progressing, we're learning more stuff. One of mm -hmm. the things, though, that is very important is, is around the masking. I think we still need to emphasize that most of the masks are needed for the healthcare system. And I want to be sure that our healthcare workers have the necessary personal protective equipment to be protected. And I don't want people out there buying masks massively and preventing hospitals from having the masks they need. Having said that, what CDC is saying, if you're going to be venturing out of the house, wear a mask. And that's OK, but it doesn't need to be a medical mask. There's thousands of people that are sewing masks for hospitals. Well, those masks that are being sewn are the ones that you can use because they're not that great in hospitals because they get wet and other things. But for people to wear in the streets, I think it's a great idea. So yes, let's have 
people's, you know, cloth masks available and people can use them. Okay. All right. Um, so if there's a surge April 22nd and then the death rate dies down to single digits by June, what then? Are we in the same place where we were March 1st? Does this mean we stay in seclusion indefinitely? Well, no, hopefully not. I hopefully at some point in time we'll be able to to come out. But I think people need to understand that this is a little bit like a like a tsunami. I think about a wave that is going to hit us and it's hitting us. And at the peak of the wave is going to be sometime in mid-April, late April. And then it's going to start going down. And then we'll see where we are and we'll see how much damage there is. And I think what the government will need to then start thinking is how do we reopen the economy? But what are the things that we go to go back to normal? And I was just talking to somebody about that. And we were talking about different scenarios. And I think there's different ways to play this out. And we don't know what the answer is going to be. But if there is more testing available, we may be able to test people and isolate people and identify people easier and maybe able to uh, you know, address it in a more like little uh, outbreaks. The other thing is we will probably have by then blood tests, serological tests available. So I'll be able to get a blood sample in you and send it to the lab and, and say, hey, you already had it, so you don't need mm -hmm. to worry about it. So maybe we let people that already have it go back to work initially. Maybe we say, well, people need to go back to work wearing masks. I mean, I think there's multiple scenarios, but no, yeah. the goal the goal is not to be where we were back in March 1st. And how far off do you think we are from those blood tests you talk about? Because those are some of the questions that we got today. People saying, I think I had it. Will I ever be able to get a test to see if I did yes. have it? I think serological tests are becoming increasingly available. And I think over the next several weeks, we'll have them available in most places. Okay. Is Georgia I, think by, I think by the end of April, there'll be many serological tests available. Good. Is Georgia getting the number of test kits it needs to fully know where we stand on the virus? Again, I'm going to say that the testing is not just about kits. This is not a kit issue. I think, you know, testing materials are coming in, what people call kits. But again, kits that are depend on the machines and on the people to run them, right? So, for example, at the hospital I work at, we have a machine that is capable of running 90 tests over an eight-hour period because that's how long it takes to, to run the test. So, over 24 hours, all you can run is 270. If you said, well, I wanted, I have tests, I have kits to run a thousand a day. Well, you don't have the machine to run a thousand a day. You don't have the personnel to run a thousand a day. Uh, you don't have, so, so there are more, there's, there's logistical, there's three throughput issues that are, are beyond the, the kits. So uh, let's not just get hung up on the kits. I think we are, we're trying to scale up and that scaling up requires get more machines, requires getting more people, requires getting a bunch of different things in order to be able to scale up to the level we would like to be at. Great. Dr. Del Rio, one piece of advice I've read and heard anecdotally goes something like, drink lots of warm, hot beverages. It washes the virus down to your stomach where the acid destroys the virus. Is there any truth to this? No. Okay. But I, but, I like, but I like drinking warm, you know, beverages. I like a cup of coffee in the morning. I love a cup of tea. But this is a good opportunity to talk about what I call a simple test, which mm -hmm. is we something we discovered is that people that have this disease, about 30% of them develop what we call anosmia, which is the inability to to uh, to smell, or egosia, the inability to taste. Right. And I tell people in the morning, I check my temperature, I see how I feel, and then I smell my coffee. And if I can do those three things, I don't have a fever, I feel good, and I can smell my coffee, I'm good to go. So that's just a, as good a test as probably a blood test right now. That is good. With partnership with the university system, Georgia will have increased ability to process tests. now. Is that to clear the backlog or will more people be able to get tested or both? I think it's both, but it's also to give more people the ability to get tested. I think the backlog is pretty much taken care of. Okay. Where is the leadership in Georgia? Aren't we prolonging the need to stay home and putting people at greater risk, including healthcare workers, by continuing to allow mayors to decide restrictions, resulting in a patchwork of restrictions across the state? And doesn't that kind of piecemeal approach send a message to those who aren't complying that the situation is less serious than it is? Well, you know, we live in a, in a even from the national level, public health is not run at the national level. It's run at the state level. And states frequently don't run it at the state level. It's run at the local level, at the county level, at the city level. So the way we organize our public health in this country, decisions have to be made local. And I would say that you know, what the decision you make in one city may not be exactly what you make in another city. So let's let's worry about, let's do what we need to do in our communities. Let's do what we need to do as individuals. 
And let's not look for people to take the initiative. If we as individuals care about this, if we stay home, we're going to stop the spread of the virus. Why would we not just go ahead and issue a national lockdown across America for a few weeks? I, I have been one of the proponents that we, we do that. I think that mm -hmm. I've been telling people, let's, let's erase April from the calendar, right? Today's the first day of April. If between April 1st and April 30th, we all went into a national shutdown and we, we did that, I think we'd be in a different position, but I'm not, I'm not the president. I'm not in the position to make that decision. So I'm in the position to make my own decisions and my own decisions is to protect myself, is to, is to remain at home, is to stay safe, is to wash my hands. And as individuals, you know, we're a very individualistic country. People here do what they think is best. So let's do what's think is best for, for myself, for my family, for my loved ones, for my community. And if we all do that, we don't need a national order. We don't need somebody to tell us what to do. Let's do it ourselves. Is there any data around people who regularly get the flu vaccine? And if there's any significant difference in mortality or getting infected with COVID-19? Well, I think there's a lot of questions there. Number one, the flu vaccine protects you from the seasonal flu. And it doesn't give a great protection, but it gives you a fairly good protection. It protects you also from developing severe disease. Now, seasonal flu has a mortality of approximately uh, 0.1 to 2.2 percent. This disease has a mortality of about 1 percent, so 10 times higher. So this disease, even though it looks like the flu, it is not the flu. It's much more severe. A mortality 10 times higher than the flu is clearly something not to not to not to say is the same. It is not. Okay. And also another big difference with the flu. In the flu, we have drugs. We have drugs like you know Tamiflu, Oseltamivir, and other things we can give. For this disease, currently we don't have available therapies. Right. In January, there were many people who thought they had the flu who experienced symptoms for a week or two. Is it possible that these people had the coronavirus and have developed an immunity to it? Is it possible that many of us have already been exposed to it? And this we talked about a little bit earlier, Dr. Del Rio. Where are we on a test to determine if that's the case? I think that's those are all really good questions. And I think I have plenty of people that I've talked to who say, yeah, maybe I had this and I just didn't know because I thought I had the flu. I was tested for the flu and it was negative. When serological tests become available, we will have answers to many of those questions. Is the virus airborne or spread by droplet? And if we're uncertain about it being airborne, shouldn't we be erring on the side of caution? Which then brings me back to the next point. This would mean we need the N95s. Well, let's be real clear. The virus is not airborne. It can be aerosolized during aerosol producing procedures, but it's not airborne. So we don't need N95 masks. We need regular masks most of the time, except if we're doing aerosolizing procedures in, in the healthcare setting. So N95 should be for healthcare setting. This virus is primarily transmitted by droplets, but increasingly we're convinced that it's also a very important route of transmission is that droplet that makes it to a surface. So I'm speaking, I'm talking, I'm coughing, I'm sneezing. My spit, my, my, my secretions make it into my hand or make it just into, a, let's say, a door handle as I'm sneezing. And it stays there for many hours. And then you come around, you touch that door handle, then you touch your face, and that's how you get infected. So I'm more concerned about the in, in, inanimate object transmission that, that I am with airborne transmission. I have read in a few places that Sweden has taken a completely different approach to combating the virus and that they've not locked down their society. In comparison to the rest of the world, their numbers seem good in terms of infections and death. Why is our approach better than theirs? And Dr. Del Rio, a note from me after I got this question, I looked up their number of cases. It looked to me like Sweden's is higher than Norway and Denmark, but that Denmark has more deaths, if you want to speak to what they're doing. Well, I'm not terribly familiar with what they're doing, so I can't really comment on that. Uh, different countries have taken different approaches. I'll give you ones that I'm familiar with. Uh, France, for example, took an approach that was very similar to the United States. It, it delayed, or Italy, there was a delay in the testing, there was a delay in doing many of the actions. Germany was very active of rapidly identifying cases, rapidly uh, isolating cases, keeping their vulnerable populations uh, uh, protected. And there's a huge difference, right? Germany has the lowest mortality in the world and, and, and Italy has the highest mortality in the world. And it, 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 they're just next to each other. But the difference is Germany, Germany, the median age of cases in Germany is 46 years. The median age of cases in Italy is 65 years. So I mm -hmm. think the impact on the elderly population was a major difference between those two countries. 
If I've recovered from the virus, do I still need to isolate? Am I safe from being reinfected and or infecting others? We're pretty certain that you're, you're immune once you've recovered. But again, we're waiting for immunologists to give us more answers to that, specific answers to that. And the group here at Emory, uh, the immunology at the Emory Vaccine Center, are working very, very hard to try to determine the correlates of immunity to this virus. Since there will likely not be a vaccine for two years, should we plan on the possibility of having to quarantine ourselves next year as well? Well, that's a good question, and I don't know the answer. It depends what happens, but uh, I'm hoping that by next year we will have a vaccine. And again, even if it comes back next year, we will have testing. It will be a very different, we'll have new medications. I think we'll be in a very different position than we are, the, we are this year. That would be good. My, my point is, is let's get over this year first. Right. Uh, is it possible the high mortality and morbidity of this year's influenza cases were complicated by undetected COVID-19? Good question. I don't think we know the answer to that. Any evidence that smoking, secondhand smoking, increases the risk of getting infected? We know that smoking, again, smoking damages your lungs, so it's bad to begin with. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it may not increase your risk of getting infected, but lung damage increases the risk of complications of the disease. So if you get infected and you're a healthy person versus if you get infected and you have somebody who has diabetes, who has lung disease, who's a smoker, who has heart disease, you're more likely to have complications. Your risk of infection may be the same. Your, your developing of complications is much different. Why do some patients die of COVID-19 when they're young or very young with no comorbidities? Because this is a serious disease with a mortality of 1%. So, you know, even if you're healthy and has a mortality of 1%, that means that one out of 100 is gonna die. So, you know, when you, when you have thousands or millions of people infected globally, there are gonna be deaths in young people. And that's why I said, the best vaccine is not to get infected. Does blood type increase your risk for coronavirus? I don't think we know the answer to that. How do we support our community outside of staying home? Any things we can do from home? I think it's very important that, you know, we, when we talk about social distancing, I like to change the term to physical distancing. I think we still need to be socially engaged. And I think, you know, using things like FaceTime and Skype and other mechanisms to, to talk to people, to get in touch with people, to connect to people. You know, I've known people that, for example, are doing virtual uh, wine tasting or virtual cocktail hour, you know, so we can do the same things that we socialize, but we don't do it in person. And I think a lot of the technology is allowing us to do that nowadays. So I would say stay engaged, stay socially engaged. Mm -hmm. uh, think what you can do for the community, right? Some people are sewing masks. That's great. Some people are helping others. I heard somebody the other day saying, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm giving money to a food bank or I'm, I'm supporting the local restaurant. I'm supporting the the people that are getting unemployed. I think there's so many things we can do. This is a time for to be a volunteer. This is a time to say, how can I help? This is a time to really be out there and, and, and really, be, you know, I think crisis bring out the best of people. Let's make sure that we all do that. I love history and have always been interested in the Spanish flu and its grip on Baltimore in 1918. My great grandfather and great aunt died in that pandemic. How will this pandemic end? and how will it change us? I think those are great questions. I think how will it end? Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's a history that is still being written. We're writing the history right now. So hopefully, mm -hmm. I mean, if I was writing the history, I would say it will end with us beating the virus and, and hopefully changing for the better, right? I think, I think out of this, one thing that I would love to see is that we think better about our safety net. We think better about our social support structure. You know, I'm, I worry a lot when you tell people stay at home. Well, what happens if you're homeless? I heard the story yeah. about somebody the other day in New York City who was walking the street. A police came over and said, you can't be out. You need to be home. It was past curfew. And this person said, this is home. I'm homeless. I live in the streets. So I think rethinking our society, rethinking about what our values are, rethinking about getting less away from, you know, the way we've been behaving up to now with, you know, trying to advance individually and economically and not thinking about everybody else, I think hopefully we'll, we'll be a better place at the end of this. And I, I sure hope so. I hope so too. I'm reading those in the ICU with COVID-19 were infected three to four weeks ago. Can you talk about the timeline and why it seems to stretch out for so long? It doesn't stretch out for so long, but if you're infected today, 
the median time to disease presentation is five days, but could be as long as 14 days. So let's suppose you're in the long end. So you don't start getting sick until 14 days from now. And then we know that once you start having symptoms, it may take you another seven to 10 days before you get very sick. So now we're talking about you being, you know, 21 days out, and then you end up in the ICU. So the course of the disease simply has to do with the incubation period and the clinical course and the clinical manifestations. If we have more concrete data that hydroxychloroquine is effective in treating COVID-19, do you think this will shorten the overall time the nation will be under stay-at-home orders? Any advances that we have in developing of, of medications will be of help. Because if it, if it doesn't change the stay-at-home orders, if we have something that could decrease the number of people that go to the intensive care unit, it will still be very good. What is the current treatment protocol in Emory now for a COVID-19 positive patient? This question just came in. I'm not sure if they're referring to um, someone who has been admitted to the hospital or is home, I'm assuming admitted. It, it, it changes. Uh, a lot of times we don't do much because you know all you need is supportive care, which is supplemental oxygen, fluids, et cetera. Once somebody gets, starts getting sicker, uh, they may go into one of the clinical trials because one of the things we're doing at Emory is advancing the science. And we do that by enrolling people in clinical trials. Clinical research is gonna give us the answer. It's not, there's no specific protocols because we don't really know what works. So we need to do the clinical research in order to know what works. So enrolling people into clinical trials is one of the many things that we're doing at Emory. And in fact, we're leading some of the clinical trials uh, trying to understand how better treat and prevent this disease. What is the recommendation for a patient under PUI who is tested negative, if you can translate PUI for me, can they immediately come out of self-quarantine or is there a specific time frame they should continue isolating? So a PUI is a person under investigation. Okay. Sounds, uh, sounds almost like a, something the yeah. FBI. The yeah, FBI it sounds a little be. bit like a crime. Right, but it isn't. So let's suppose I come into the hospital and I have a fever or a cough, I don't feel well, and they said, hmm, Del Rio maybe has COVID, we don't know. So you, the first you become a PUI and you get a blood test. And then the blood test, or the, the, not a blood test, I'm sorry, a nasal test mm -hmm. for a virus. And the, and the test comes back positive. Well, now you move from being a PUI to being a, a COVID patient. But let's suppose the test comes back negative. So the doctor seeing me is gonna come back and say, well, you know, your test was negative, but a negative test doesn't rule out the disease. And we clinically think you still have the disease. So we're gonna call you a PUI, a, most likely a, a clinical case of COVID. So you may not come you know, off, off, uh, off investigation. You will still be kept in isolation. But let's suppose that my test comes back negative and then all of a sudden I develop uh, uh, diarrhea and I have, or I have a urine in tract infection. And they said, no, your fever was due to, the reason you felt bad was because you had a urinary tract infection. It has nothing to do with COVID. So now you're totally no longer a PUI and you're taken off isolation. So it's not a simple yes, no. It really requires somebody who's an expert to, to help make right. that decision. And, and at, at our hospital, it's really the infectious disease physicians who are helping make those determinations. And that's what they're trained to do. But again, the infectious disease physicians, my colleagues in infectious disease are incredibly strained because they are just being pulled in all sorts of directions because exactly of this disease. Right. Our next question, um, it reminds me of something I thought of. We've been seeing these crazy high pollen counts, which makes people feel a little sluggish and less than great, which right now with COVID-19 can be pretty scary. This person says, since pollen counts are high, is it better to stay inside to preserve lung health and not be as easily infected by the virus? Well, you know, I mean, I think, I think it's better to stay inside, but if you wanna go outside, it's okay. I recommend, I go on daily walks and I try to get outside. But again, if the pollen counts are high, my biggest concern is I start itching and I itch in my nose and I itch in my eyes and I have this enormous desire to start scratching them. And I have to really call myself and say, don't do that, don't touch your face. Right. So my biggest challenge is actually coping with the allergy symptoms more than, my, than other damage to my lungs. Now, if you happen to have asthma or reactive lung disease, yeah, I'd rather have you not go outside. Um, skewing a trial is never good, but is there a possibility of getting into a vaccine trial with comorbidities? We have to accept at some point the people at risk are a major reason for shelter in place orders. Well, we have different phases on a phase, on a clinical trial. The first phase of a clinical trial is what we're doing right now with a vaccine is called the phase one, which is the safety part. And for the safety part, you want to have the healthiest possible individuals in the trial. If the vaccine is, is proven to be safe, 
an immunogenic, then you advance to the to the stage two of the trial. And the stage two of the trial is the efficacy part. And for efficacy, you want to enroll all sorts of individuals, young, old, at high risk, at low risk, because you really want to see if the vaccine protects you from disease. So yes, once we get to stage two, we will be enrolling people with comorbidities and other diseases. <clears throat> Um, why aren't we closing the Beltline in other parks where people are congregating? Um, Dr. Del Rio, I saw this in my own neighborhood this weekend. The national park in my neighborhood in town was closed, um, but there were hundreds of cars on the street and everybody had um, gone in to enjoy the park and make it crowded. Um, your thoughts on all of that and well, so, why so they're my, not closed. So my thought is, is number one, I, I still would like as much as possible to keep the parks and the Beltline open because I think it's important for people to get outside to exercise and to and to not you know, get cabin fever and claustrophobic from being inside all the time. And again, if you're inside with your kids in a small apartment, it's nice to get outside, but I've been thinking about what we, can we do to limit crowds. And again, we're floating several possibilities. I talked to the mayor this morning about it. I mean, one possibility would be you know, some sort of honor system in which if your last name starts with an, you know, with certain letters, you can go certain days. If your last name starts with other letters, you go other days. I mean, can we, and again, can we as citizens self-regulate ourselves? Can we be, you know, can we be citizens enough to say, hey, there's too many people I'm not going to go in right now. I mean, very much like grocery stores are doing. Can we limit the number of people that go in at a very given time? I think we, we really, again, we all have to participate. I, I really don't think we need to be hyper police, we need to personally take responsibility. And I would encourage people to to continue to do that. You know, if if going to the park, you know, when you look at, uh, we were looking at when people are in the bed line, the biggest influx of people in the bed line is around 5 p.m. So why don't we spread people out? Why don't we say maybe, you know, older people can go in, only people over the age of 60 can go between, let's say eight in the morning and, and noon. And then from noon to five, you can have people you know, with kids. And then after five, you have people that are over the age of, of 30, but on the age of 60. I mean, can we come up with something that spreads people out? I yeah. think we can. I think it would be smart to do something other than what's happening right now, for uh, sure. I agree. I agree. Um, so this question for you is from a, a doctor who is not on the front line. My medical question, any thoughts about intubated COVID patients are not the typical ARDS patients. If you could translate that for us, Dr. Del Rio. Um, I see you COVID Doctors are postulating this. Treatment is different on the vent. Could be critical going forward. Thank you. Well, I would say, number one, I'm not an ICU specialist, so I really cannot comment. I have heard from my colleagues that, it, indeed, managing this patient is, is difficult, is not s straightforward. The ARDS is acute respiratory distress syndrome. That means that the lungs get full with fluid and inflammatory cells, and that's what limits uh, the ability of oxygen to get into the blood. And therefore, you have to use a, a breathing tube, an endotracheal tube, and you have to put a person on a ventilator, which is a machine that, that pumps oxygen into your lungs. Uh, that's what ICU people do. But I will tell you from talking to my ICU colleagues that they also have seen people do fine and get off the vent and, and, and get out of the intensive care unit. So in proper hands, uh, every patient is different. And that's why we have people trained in critical care medicine who actually do this. What is your take on someone who's been taking elderberry prior to the COVID outbreak to continue for an immune boost? And what about vitamin C, zinc, et cetera? A lot of misinformation out there. Yeah, and a lot of things that I don't think make any difference. So, you know, I personally think that the most important thing is to stay healthy, sleep well, exercise, eat a healthy diet, don't smoke, and control your weight. You know, what, one thing that I would say is a lot of the people we're seeing in the hospital, especially with complications, are overweight, they have diabetes. So, you know, controlling your diet, your weight, your chronic diseases, this is a good opportunity to think about having a healthy life. And I would encourage people to, to really decide that, okay, maybe the, the, the obesity, the, the diabetes, all those other comorbidities are actually a, a potential threat, not only from COVID, but from future diseases. So let's have this as an opportunity to maybe start eating healthier, exercising, mm -hmm. and getting into a healthy lifestyle. Is it true that a family within a house is almost 100% likely for all members to be infected? I'm guessing from this question they're talking about if one member of the family has it. Yes, if that one member of the family has it and doesn't isolate, 
it can rapidly spread to other members of the family. And in fact, the Chinese showed us that very effectively. So what the Chinese did, which I think we'll never do in this country, if they found somebody who was infected, they took that person and they put them in a hotel or in a, a unit away from their family, right? Once they started seeing a lot of transmission. I think we, if you have a small house, that's gonna be a problem. But if you have a house that has a, you know, a bedroom that you can have that person isolate themselves, I have a, several friends of mine who have been infected, including one of them who's been very uh, vocal about it. His name is Dr. Michael Sag. He lives in Alabama and he's been posting on Facebook and he's been writing about it. And Michael Sag got to his house, has been in his room, has not gone out. He has delivered his food there, et cetera. And now he's recovered and he never infected anybody in his family. So he did the right things. He isolated himself mm -hmm. at home to prevent spread to his family. For how long can asymptomatic people transmit COVID-19? Well, we're not sure how, even if asymptomatic people transmit COVID-19. Mm -hmm. they, they may have a role in transmission, but where we're more concerned is people with mild symptoms. Remember I told you 80% of people with this disease have mild symptoms, don't need to be in the hospital. And that's what I worry about is the individual who has a little bit of sniffles, a little bit of cough, feels a little bad, but not bad enough to stay home. And that person continues going to work, continues going meeting other people. And those are the bigger, the major drivers of transmission of this disease is the people with mild disease. What are some of the difficulties vaccine researchers have been encountering when developing this vaccine? Is there anything the general public can do to help in the effort? Well, I, again, I'm not a vaccine developer, so not, right. I cannot tell you, but I can tell you that a lot of companies are developing vaccines. So, so it looks like developing this vaccine is a lot easier than developing an HIV vaccine, for example. We've been for years trying to find an HIV vaccine and haven't gotten there. But in this virus, it, it, it's coronaviruses tend to be easier to develop vaccines for. So hopefully what the scientists are doing is, is, is developing a vaccine. What can we as general public do? Well, we need to write to Congress and we need to support research because it's through research that we find the correlates of immunity and that we do the clinical trials that lead us to vaccines. So when people say, well, how is research benefiting me? It is benefiting you right now, every day, improving your lives and protecting you. So supporting research is somebody very, very concrete that the general public can do. Uh, Dr. Del Rio, you and I talked about this the very first time we did a Facebook Live, but somebody said, can you speak to the controversy about ibuprofen and COVID-19? So one doctor in France reported four cases of young people in the ICU who were pretty sick and said, uh, the only thing he could find as a reason why they were in the ICU is that they had been taking ibuprofen, high dose of ibuprofen to control their fever before they came to the hospital. As a result of that, the Minister of Health in France said people should not take ibuprofen. Uh, and the theory behind it is that ibuprofen increases, upregulates your ACE2 receptor, and the ACE2 receptor is a receptor the virus uses to get into cells. Now, that's all theoretical. Other people have challenged that and have said, no, this is not true. And so it's still pretty controversial. My recommendation is if you have a fever and you don't know the cause of the fever, rather than taking ibuprofen, mm -hmm. you know, take Tylenol, take paracetamol, take something else that is not ibuprofen. Having said that, if you're taking ibuprofen because you need it for gout or for other disease, you need to continue taking the medications because, you know, the likelihood of you developing COVID are lower than the likelihood of you having complications that ibuprofen is controlling. How safe is it for healthcare workers to be working now if they have underlying conditions such as asthma or autoimmune diseases? Again, it, you know, for all of us in healthcare, uh, we are all concerned about getting infected. And I think we're all doing whatever we can to not get infected. And whether that's wearing goggles, wearing masks, uh, washing our hands, using gowns, uh, the risk of infection is the same if you don't use your personal protective equipment. So training healthcare workers in use of PPE is one of the most important strategies we're doing in all the healthcare systems in the country. A couple more, and then we're gonna wrap it up with you. They're coming in fast and furious. Does it look hopeful that the vaccine will give long-term immunity rather than needing seasonal vaccines? I mean, it's, it's a question that doesn't have an answer because we don't even know if the vaccine works. We don't even know how long the immunity from the vaccine is. So I, the answer to that is who knows? When do you think this will all be over? That is the million dollar question. I know it certainly doesn't stop people from asking it. Well, you know, I think it'll be over at some point. When exactly, <laughs> I don't know. I'm hoping that, you know, people ask me that all the time. 
My hope, based on the modeling and what we're seeing, is sometime in the late summer, early fall, we will be looking back at this. I'm talking about, you know, July, August, early September, somewhere in there, we'll be looking back and saying, okay, it's over. But, but how long it lasts and how severe it is depends on all of us. If we stay home, if we practice social distancing, if we do the right things we need to do and we decrease transmission, it's gonna last a lot less. So when people say, how long is it gonna last? I tell, it's really up to you. President Trump said yesterday, we have a couple very difficult or painful weeks ahead. Do you agree? I agree. And I, I said that to our incoming uh, young physicians, residents here at Grady this morning. This is going to be the toughest month of your life. But this mm -hmm. is what we train for. This is why we went to medical school. This is why we're doctors. This is what we are here for. And we're going to do it. And again, I remind myself, uh, I read the other day the letter that that uh, General Eisenhower wrote to to the the soldiers as they were getting ready to disembark in in D-Day and getting ready to go to Normandy and disembark in D-Day, mm -hmm. and he didn't say to them, "This is going to be easy. This is going to be a you know a walk in the beach. This is going to be simple." He said, "This is going to be the, the the fight of your lives. The enemy is prepared. The enemy is well trained, but we're going to be victorious." And I say the same thing. You know, this is going to be the toughest month of your life. The enemy is tough but we're well prepared and we're gonna be victorious. My last question for you, if we're, we're talking about this third week in April, are, are, Dr. Del Rio, are we talking about finally getting over the crest, if you will, to get on the, going on the downside of this? Is, would that be the crest, the peak, and then we get to go down? It all depends on whether we do the things that we need to do. Mm -hmm. the, that will happen if we continue practicing or even do more social distancing. If we don't, it will continue going up and up and up and up. So don't look at that day like, okay, we're done. I think it all depends on, on us doing the right things and continue doing the right things. So, so that crest depends on us. And that depends on us staying home for right now, if at all possible. Uh, absolutely. I mean, if, if, I, if I can put a goal for people in this month is don't get infected and don't infect others. Because if you don't get infected, you're one less person to worry about. You're one less person who can transmit to others. And I'm gonna say this to, to conclude, because of the dynamics of this virus, if you're infected and you start you know, moving around and doing your usual stuff, at the end of 30 days, approximately 400 people are gonna be infected as a result of that one person. If you practice social distancing and we decrease your movement and you would decrease your contact with others by 75%, at the end of 30 days, out of that one person infected, you're only going to have two and a half to three people infected. So wow. that one person could dramatically change what happens in 30 days by doing the right thing. So each one of us is enormously responsible for what happens in Georgia in the next month. Absolutely. It's not up to anybody else but ourselves. Don't ask what, don't ask what the governor or the government can do for you to stop COVID-19. Ask what you can do to stop COVID-19. I like the way you took that quote and made it your own. Dr. Del Rio, thank you, as always, for answering all of these questions from everyone. And we hope to see you soon. And um, thank you for all that you're doing right now to keep us informed and help us stay safe. And thank you and appreciate being with you. All right, Dr. Del Rio, see you soon. Bye. Bye. All right, everyone. We'll see you very soon. Take care. Stay home. Be safe.